So this webinar is guard banding method five versus method six. A little bit about our company. Uh, Morehouse is a manufacturing company that produces force calibration equipment and adapters that are used in industry to measure force. We have state-of-the-art force and torque calibration laboratories and offer calibrations at a very high level of accuracy. More information can be found at www.mhforce.com. My name is Henry Zumbrun. I've been with Morehouse for tw the last 20 years. Uh, I've been president since 2015. If you've attended NCSLI events, uh, you probably see me, or if you've attended training or uh, other other things. This year we'll be at M MSC. If anyone's going to MSC, we'll be there as well. So our agenda for today um, is why, uh, first, why people are so concerned with risk now. Uh, it was actually part of the 2005 standard. Um, test uncertainty ratio and what it what this means. Method five versus method six. And then using the Morehouse equals MC3 spreadsheet, which that was created by Dilip Shaw. Dilip is the uh, co-author of the Metrology Handbook and also someone that helps out from time to time, specifically with our uh, three and a half and week long trainings. Dilip is here uh, as well. He teaches the class with me, and some days he teaches solo by himself. So, again, if anyone has questions, type them, type them in the uh, chat bar. If we start looking at the differences in these standards, uh, 2017, 2005 to 2017, and you know why is why are people concerned with risks now? You know the 2005 standard uh, manage risk relied on policies, procedures, job descriptions, top management, quality manager, uh, sometimes, you know, a technical manager. And then 2017, the, the requirements are a bit different. It focuses more on risk and opportunity uh, and says management requires documented info, processes, and the big one is decision rules. And that's what we're talking about today, decision rules. Method five, method six are decision rules. So in 2017, focus is more on minimizing a lab's risk exposure. And many of the should references of, of 20, 2005 are replaced with shall. Now I said, I said before, and here's the exact section. So you're, if you're sitting there and you're not accredited to ISO 17, 025 2005 uh, or 2017 but are to 2005 you still need to comply with this statement it's 5.10.4.2 it says when statements of compliance are made the uncertainty of measurement shall be taken into account really a lot of that is guard banding and what we're talking about today so moving forward which if you are accredited you will be um accredited to the new ISO standard, IEC, uh, ISO 17025-2017, and the sections uh, concerning risk is 7.8.6.1 that states clearly the laboratory shall document the decision rule employed, and 7.8.6.2, uh, which says the laboratory shall report on the statement of conformity such that the statement clearly identifies to which the result statement applies and which specification, standard, or parts thereof are met or not met, and this is a big one, the decision rule applied unless it is inherent in the requested specification or standard. So we're going to talk about decision rules. We're first going to want to understand a little bit about TUR. This definition on TUR comes specifically from NCSLI ANSI uh, Z540. And it says a test uncertainty ratio. A test uncertainty is the ratio of a span of tolerance of a measurement quantity subject to calibration to twice the 95% expanded uncertainty of the measurement process used for calibration. So Simply, the TUR is the tolerance divided by the calibration process and certainty. So if you have a device that's 0.1% of full scale, that's your tolerance, and you're going to divide it by how well you know your measurement. And to complicate things or simplify them, depending on how much math you want to do, the actual formula for that process uncertainty is listed here, and it is the... Uh, two times the CMC divided by the appropriate coverage factor that was used for that CNC, uh, raised raised to a uh, power of two, uh, plus the resolution of the UT. Right there, we used root 12 divisor, uh, as most people do, and then the repeatability, and all of these are squared. So it's really the tolerance divided by two times the standard uncertainty, which will give you the tolerance divided by the expanded uncertainty. 
If we look at this in more detail, say we have a 10,000 pound load cell with an accuracy of 0.05% of full scale, uh, 0.01 pound resolution and 0.05 pound repeatability. These are the, all of the things that go in that divisor. If we look at this in more detail, if we compare, you know, ourself, Morehouse with primary standards to a lab with, you know, say using secondary standards, for this particular device, when we talk about that ratio, uh, on the Morehouse side using dead weight, the TUR would be 22 to 1. And on the side of, you know, a standard force, you know, force machine, hydraulic force machine uh, with 0.5% of applied, you know, they're all over the place, 0.4, 0.5, 0.037. Um, the TUR could be, could be 1 to 1 or even lower. Uh, so the question I then ask is, do you think a 1 to 1 TUR will meet ISO IEC 17 to uh, section 6.4.5, which states, the equipment used for measurement shall be capable of choosing the measurement accuracy and or measurement uncertainty required to provide a valid result. It may be able to do it, but if we start looking at graphs, specifically this graph on a 22 uh, to, to 1 TUR versus a 1 to 1 TUR, we start looking at risk. And when we're looking at risk, then we start looking at decision rules. But here we're just looking at the graph. And you can see by this graph, the that lab that's 0.5% has about 4.55% of the graph hanging out of each side of the tolerance limit or 2.28 percent uh, on each side of the tolerant limit tolerance limit so this scenario uh, what do you think happens if we move the measurement you look at the one side you look at the other side if we move the measurement to 10,004 the one we we with that 22 uh, to 1 TUR can still say the device is in tolerance, the other lab's going to have to issue an out of tolerance condition. If you also look at this, the risk goes uh, from 4.55% with that other lab to 34.47%. And there is there are cases in which case that this lab then cannot issue a pass and it puts the onus on the end user to figure out if the measurement is good enough. Do I have to do a recall? Did I have an allo tolerance? Can I accept the risk level? All of these things are very, very important when making uh, valuations to the new standard. I like to say that this way. There's many ways to say it. I like to say it. the larger the TUR, the more room you have. Uh, this situation, we can clearly get out of our car without banging into the car door beside us. You could have a barn door effect where, you know, the barn door is huge when you have a large TUR versus the needle in the haystack when you're you're at that lab where it's a one-to-one -one TUR and the location of the measurement is critical. However, we're not there yet and we will talk about the location of the measurement and that's right here at the next slide. What I have to tell everybody is it does TUR does not matter ever when you're on the tolerance limit. So if you are on the edge of that specification limit, in this case, you know, we our measured value is 10,005. If we are on that, so this 10,005 right here, if we are on that, no matter what lab does this, 50% of the curve at least 50% of the curve is going to hang out and the risk is going to be at least 50%. So all of this area of the curve to the right is risk. And when you are on that tolerance limit, you have a 50% chance of the measurement being in and you have a 50% of the measurement being out. doesn't matter if I have a 4 to 1 TUR, or 20 to 1 TUR, or 100 to 1 TUR does not mean anything if we are at the edge of the tolerance limit. So let's explain that in a little bit more detail. And we're going to discuss, as, as I said, we're going to discuss method five versus method six. Um, here, most people who implement guard bands are using this handbook. The handbook has six methods total for guard bands. It's the ANSI NCSLI Z540.3 2006. This handbook is free. If you are an NCSLI member, 
you can download it for free. You have to go to my NCSLI and use your login and password. If you are not an NCSLI member, uh, I will do a plug for NCSLI. I highly, highly recommend becoming one as you can get all of their documentation, the RPs, the laboratory managements, the, uh, you know, the, all the documents, uh, from them very very good documents uh, for force they, they have rp12 they have laboratory management they have risk management documents just really really good organization uh, again and if you are a member you can go to my ncsli um, and log in and then you can download this particular manual so guard bands um, really where, where did this come about um, the term guard band or sometimes called, you know, you know, guard band with a space or sometimes called guard band without a space uh, appears to have its origins in early radio days when the band of frequencies expected to be utilized by two radio channels or stations were separated by a band of frequency that served to guard against mutual interference by the two channels. Makes sense, right? So right here on our individual channels, if those frequencies do not cross, I will, I'm not going to, sh I should not have interference and I should be able to broadcast clear, uh, concise signal. As used in, as used in the national standard, a guard band, here I'm using the one with the space, which you see often mentioned in Z540.3, the handbook, is used to change the criteria for making a measurement decision, such as pass or fail, from some tolerance or specification limits to achieve a defined object, such as 2% probability of false accept, the offset may either be added to or subtracted from the decision value to achieve this objective. Here's an important statement. This is from NASA, and this is, this is why we are so concerned with guard bands. Now, if you're a manufacturer and we said, you know, um, false accept and false reject, if you're a manufacturer, it becomes manufacturer's risk if if we if we are passing um, if we are rejecting too many things of the lot, uh, and that's where maybe you want to switch to a method six guard band. But it is consumer's risk if it's to the other side of that curve, and if it's to the other side of that curve, reduced end of item function or capacity, mission loss or compromise, loss of life damage corporate reputation, warranty expenses, shipping and associated costs for returned items, loss of future sales, punitive damages, legal fees. You know, this is this all came from a NASA reference publication 1342. So, and in this business, in this specifically the force business, a uh, false accept can be the reason a rocket blows up. Uh, a false accept uh, on a critical component be, may result in loss of life. You know, we, we cannot bring people back, but we can be smarter about our measurements. We can do things like not send items to that lab that can only meet a one-to-one -one or that's always going to carry a lot of risk on a critical component. Uh, we, can, we can do things such as implement guard bands as the new 17025 standard quite clearly wants people to do. So, and why use guard bands in lieu of these common statements? You know, before you'd see people saying, hey, the standard must be at least 10 times as accurate as the gauge being calibrated, or I need to maintain a four to one T TAR. As long as I maintain that, you know, four to one TAR, I'm, I'm better. So let's look at specifically this four to one TAR and what this means. This, this For those that do not know, uh, TAR is test accuracy ratio. It's basically saying if I have a 0.1% device, I need a device that's known to better than 0.025% to calibrate that device. And if, if I can do that, my, I'm golden. Everything, every measurement I make must be good. It doesn't account for adapters, doesn't account for physical, com other physical components, doesn't account for a lot of things. The main thing with this, if we start at a four to one ratio, and we start at process measurement and we go up, this means that process measurement one for general calibration, yeah, we can probably maintain a four to one. Then working metrology labs need to be six times greater. Reference metrological laboratories, that's where we are, Morehouse, yay. We need to be 64 times greater than that. This needs to be 256 times greater. And then the BIPM 
needs to be 1024. So it is impossible to maintain TAR ratios when looking at metrological traceability. And metrological traceability is the property of a measurement result whereby the result can be related to a reference through a documented unbroken chain of calibrations, each contributing to the measurement uncertainty. So how does that look? Well, that looks like this. So we start with SI definitions, then we go SI definitions here, then we go to the NMIs, and every time we step down, the uncertainty gets larger. The measurement uncertainty data is cumulative from one level to the hierarchy to another. So we have a true pyramid, and it is very maintainable. Uh, if NIST does a CAL for us, we cannot be better than NIST. So if we, if we start looking at these specifically for force, NIST is four parts per million. We're eight parts per million. Most accredited CAL suppliers are O2. Uh, working standards are typically 0.1, and field measurement is typically half. And that's for standard uncertainty. So double those numbers for uh, expanded uncertainty. And then you get your testing, most of the testing done at 1%, if, if those are familiar with that. And we start talking about terms PFA, which is that probability of false accept. Uh, this is from directly from page 52 of the Z540.3 handbook. The estimation of PFA is statistical process that depends on relevant data, characteristics of calibration process, and mathematical analysis. And we look further into that handbook, and NCSLI gives us six guidance, uh, six methods. Uh, the first three specifically deal with PFA. Uh, you have test, popu test point, t method one, test point population data. Method two, um, M and TE population data. Method three, acceptance subpopulation, PFA estimation. And method four is a uh, uh, Bayesian. So these methods, a lot of them rely on taking population or manufacturers, uh, the model numbers of instrumentation and using like similar similar items to, to make this estimation. And it just becomes a data nightmare for lots of labs that are using, you know, or calibrating more than one item. Um, a good example of it, uh, of this would be the, uh, the Navy where, um, a lot of the times they control their equipment. And if they can control their equipment, they can analyze like equipment and they can predict end of period reliability. They can do these other methods fairly simple. Uh, for us as a commercial lab, seeing all types of different manufacturing, uh, manufacturers equipment and devices, we're, we're left with the easiest way to, to do is to comply with uh, the new ANSI or the new uh, ISO 17025 is to use guard band method five or method six. And I assume most other people are in that same situation where they don't have control of everything that comes in and out of their labs. So we decided, or I decided to say, hey, let's, let's do a webinar on these methods and their importance. So we have methods five and six. Uh, they calculate acceptance limits to assure the PFA requirement is met, but without actually estimating a PFA value for the calibration process. That's more of that can be found on the, in the handbook on page 55. If we, if we look at method five, that's based on the expanded calibration process. You know, it's one simple approach to guard band is to calculate acceptance limits by subtracting the 95% expanded calibration process uncertainty from the tolerance limits. This approach is recommended by ILAC G8, at least the current document of G8. There is a new document in draft which has decision matrices and all kinds of other things that will be out that, that's a very good document. Do not know when it's coming out. Um, but currently recommended by G8, if the measurement is within if the measurement result is within such acceptance limits, the PFA is very small and therefore assured of meeting the 2% PFA requirement. Well, we're gonna find out a little bit more about this. The only information necessary for this guard banding approach is the tolerance and the calibration process measurement uncertainty. So, and then however, so working on this, working on the Excel spreadsheet, which we're going to go to live and I'll show people how to use it, um, I found some issues. And uh, um, if when you find issues, you make calls, you make calls and people explain things. This particular one, I was able to call um, Mr. Dillip Shaw and say, hey, what's going on here? 
He instructed me that the people who wrote the standard use 95.45% as a confidence level, which in most cases have a, has a coverage factor of two. If we do just subtract the expanded uncertainty here, if we do do this and we do the math, just by subtracting that expanded uncertainty, it results in 2.275% or less risk when we enter X is the measured value. So in this case, I have a lot of stuff going on in this uh, slide. So if guard bands limits to assure risk less than, you know, two and a half percent, their their numbers are here. Simple guard band with subtraction only. This is, I'll point to it with my highlighter. This is what method five is saying to do. And in this example, it says, hey, if I'm within 99.6.002 or, you know, uh, 1003.998, I should have that 2% risk, but I actually have the 2.27, which is why I highlighted that other formula above. And if I look at what I need for 2%, it's it's the lower guard band and the upper guard band are more and less. So 99.6.002 becomes 996.029. And we'll you know we'll look at we'll look at this uh, specifically if I type in that 996.029. Sure enough. My total risk is 2%. So basically, that's what we're sa I'm saying is be wary of the method five and just subtracting the uncertainty because you will if you think if you think you're getting 2.275 or 2.2 percent risk, you may be getting 2.275 if you are right on that actual limit that it calculates. So it's, so it's something to be wary of. Our Excel sheet will allow you to stick in 2% and go from there. Uh, more about method five guard bands, uh, based on, again, based on measurement and certainty, as simple as cal calculate. Uh, the test limit is based on the worst case PFA that will be accepted for any individual measurement. And the downside is if you're a calibration laboratory, you may be rejecting and adjusting equipment if if that is what the customer wants uh, because they may be way too aggressive. And what it, what's happening here is in what I showed earlier, a small relative expanded uncertainty versus a large one. Here in this case, you know, small Morehouse using Morehouse using dead weights. Um, same thing as I showed with those graphs. Much larger acceptance interview or uh, interval. And here we have maybe maybe we have those secondary standards where the acceptance interval is is much less than if we're using you know standards with much, much um, lower uncertainties. So here's an example of one of our test reports using method five. Here we state the T, we state the TUR, we state the PFA and the pass fail. So, and then at the bottom, we say what we're gonna do. Uh, compliance pass is a specification, uh, analyze in accordance with method five. Uh, for this method, when the TUR is less than four to one, the upper and lower acceptance limits are guard banded offset by the expanded uncertainty. Now we are going to change some of this wording when the new ILAC G8 document comes out because we're gonna follow G8 and, and go more with, uh, uh, offer various different methods uh, and have that will take place during the contract review. So we talked about method five. Uh, yeah, they're very aggressive. So now we have a, a, an alternate method um, that's less aggressive, uh, method six, which takes um, makes use of an observation that for a given test uncertainty ratio, there's a maximum PFA value for all values of the M&T test point intolerance probability and by applying a guard band based on the maximum PFA value and the corresponding TUR ensures that the PFA is 2% or less, regardless of the intolerance probability. As I said, the uh, advantage of this approach compared to the other method is that it does not require estimation of the M&T test point, and, and that's, that's really those other four methods. So method six, it's still simple to calculate as they depend only on the measurement uncertainty when compared with the specification limits of the unit under test. The formula at, uh, at first can be, maybe, maybe it's a little daunting, um, this is in that ANSI Z540.3 handbook. The you know 
here, and here it is, A2% equals L minus U95% times M2. You can change U to 99% if you, if you want to do that. It's uh, A2 is the acceptance limit for 2%, L is the tolerance limit, uh, U is the calibration process. Here's where you can change this to, uh, to uh, 99% and our Excel sheet will do that. I'll show you, it's kind of hidden in that. So if we look at these, we, we've seen traditional graphs so far where I've used, you know, method five. This graph here uh, in this risk sheet uses both method six and method five. Now the total risk is going to be the same. If it, the risk is, as I said, is anything over the tolerance limit of this graph is the risk. You could have, uh, with method six, you could have area over this that's larger than 2% because it's logarithmic. And by logarithmic, I mean, it draws a different curve than what was, what was shown right there. But method six, um, it's based on that TUR formula. And the important thing is you need to make some corrections to that formula that were shown because if you have high TURs, Method six may not work. Here's a situation where the TR is 85.16. Tolerance limit should be plus or minus five here. Hope everybody's following, following along. And if we enter all this information in, in using the method six formula, it will calculate the tolerance limit. It will say I'm okay at 5.12%. So, or 5.12 pounds. Uh, where my actual tolerance is plus or minus five. So this is incorrect. The way around this is to put some if, vary some if statements in and say, hey, if I have a tolerance above, you know, four and a half or 4.6, then use 4.6. Don't use 85.16 because that's going to give me acceptance limits that are larger than what my tolerance limits are. If we compare, uh, this is a deliberate comparison where we have hey, we have this particular one, we have a Morehouse cell with a PSD indicator. Uh, here's a bunch of different raw data in here entered, in, entered into the equation. Uh, if you notice, I put some bum points at the end. Um, this is not a typical calibration. I added some bum points in this uh, second run here to, to demonstrate the difference between method five and method six. So these devices, typically uh, people, customers send, want something that's direct read uh, that has that's good to 0.05% of full scale. Well, we can do that with our calibration grade cell and the PSD indicator. If we look at guard banding, uh, this equipment, and remember I put in those those high readings at the bottom just to show that if we look at method five versus method six, over here in method six, those last three readings that I circled where I, you know, put in right in here where I put in the high readings, that's going to produce a fail uh, where the total risk is going to be above 2%. Whereas if I use method six, I have everything going the whole way down here, I have everything that passes, and I apologize, it's a lot to fit on a sheet, but that's why I did this. So we can look at it uh, uh, better, a summary between the two methods is, and the difference between acceptance limits here. So method six, the difference between five and six here, method six allows me that much more acceptance than what method uh, five does in this scenario, 3.49, 3.43 versus 0.99 and uh, 0.89. So in this situation, method six, everything passes. Method five, um, we have some, some criteria where it fails. Now, if we would reprogram, if we would say, okay, method five is aggressive, we reprogram it, we could get that instrument, knowing that instrument very well, we could get it to pass. So looking at that, what happens, this is this this method right here, we're using, this is a Morehouse example, what happens if we switch this to, you know, another lab using secondary standards? This same device with that, uh, the CMC of the other lab at 0.05% uh, where we changed it, will fail on both methods now. Uh, again, the importance of that denominator, um, that that T U that that formula for calibration process uncertainty, it depends highly on which calibration provider you choose and how good the repeatability of the equipment is and what is the resolution. So, um, 
makes both methods fail if we change it. The uncertainty of the lab performing makes a huge difference. Now, say we had this equipment and we wanted to do something else. We said, okay, I don't want you to adjust it, but I want you to pass it for me. And I'm okay. I really don't need my measurements to be, you know, better than 0.1%. So let's raise the tolerance limit. Something else we can do to 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 make the 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 statements of conformance are to actually raise the tolerance limit. You know, to contact the customer, get the agreement, raise the tolerance limits. In this case, if we raise the tolerance limits to 0.1%, everything would pass. And we went back to using us as a Cal supplier, but both method five and method six would pass. So it's, there's different things that we can, there's different things that we can do. And uh, we're going to go through three examples here with, with, with our equipment. Here's a, here's a PCM machine. And the question here, is it accurate enough to calibrate the UUT? So I have typical calibration and measurement capability is 0.02% of applied force. That's what we're using as our reference standard, this PCM that goes to 2,000 pounds. Here we're going to we're going to analyze it using a digital force gauge. Here or um, analog, yeah, a digital force gauge that we manufacture. Here's a handheld force gauge and then analyze it against another load cell. And the UUT tolerances are going to vary 0.5% 0.1% and 0.25%. So that's going to be a difficult one. So a device with an 0.2% of applied force, can it calibrate uh, um, a device uh, where it needs to be 0.025% of full scale? So the first one, uh, force gauge uh, with a CMC of 0.02% and UT resolution of 0.2%. LBF, as long as the UT reads between those two numbers, the system would be accurate enough to calibrate the UUT, and I drew them at the limits. So you can see here, measured value 995.4, and we're in. Uh, we're way off to the one side. So we, we have a wide window. It's pretty safely to say that uh, there, there's a lot of room. Uh, the barn door effect or the large parking space. If we look at this, you know, method five versus method six, uh, same thing. Method six is going to be passed. Method five is passed. If we look at the second scenario where we're, we're, we're changing the tolerance to 0.1% of full scale for the uh, right here for the handheld force gauge, we're good as long as the UUT reads between 499.7 and 500.3. Now remember, the, the specification limits are 499.5 and 500.5 based on just tolerance. So we're going to lose 0.2 counts, or we're going to lose two counts, or 0.2 each way uh, on on that curve. So if we look at this guard banding method six, yes, same thing. If we're going to pass for method five, we're going to pass for method six. Uh, you can you can see here it's really hard to see the method six line because it lines up with the tolerance limit. So there are two lines there, which I will show in the next example. Uh, here's an example with a CMC of 02 and a UUT resolution of 0.01. Uh, here's a 2,000 pound load cell with a tolerance of 0.25% of full scale. This one's the harder one. So if our measured value is centered here, you can see tolerance limit here. You can see the method six guard band here, and you can see the um, other guard band there. Uh, so if we compare these guard bands uh, right here, the method five uh, nominal value allows between 199.5 and you know this is that tolerance of uh, the 0.025 of full scale 199.5 uh, versus the upper specification limit of 2000.5 if we look at the guard bands here very little using method five that location of the measurement needs to be all but perfect almost and then method six gives us more but it's still it's still rather tight so we can use that PCM to do a one-to-one -one or a little over one-to-one -one TOR, but our location of our measurement needs to be so centered um, that any any variation to one side or the other when we're dealing with tight tolerances is is probably going to produce a uh, more than 2% risk. 
Here was an example where we took a torque wrench, um, a digital solutions torque wrench, very good torque wrench, and um, it's digital point, it's 1% of reading. And we did the test where the CMC was 0.5%. It was a torque tester device that we used to do the test on it. And just comparing method, uh, method six and method five here on this test, both uh, passed in this scenario. So depending torque wrench CMCs, uh, depending what you, the CMC is of the calibration supplier is going to depend on the method and how good it is, whether, you're, whether you can pass or not. There is something else to consider here. Uh, this is from the uh, ILAC G8 document with it's in draft. And it may be wise to consider to, to evaluate, uh, specifically if you're the Cal Lab or if, you're the, or if you're the user of the equipment, to evaluate what acceptance criteria I really need. Um, sometimes manufacturers, manufacturers spec their equipment that where it just cannot be met. The, the resolution is too high, the repeatability is too much, where no matter what you do, even if your measurement is dead center, you're going to have more than 2% risk. And if that is the case, it may be wise to consider things as conditional accepts, you know, and that is where we have our guard band, but our between our guard band and our tolerance limit, we, hey, we know we're going to have some risk, but in this, maybe we can live with it. And it's a conditional accept where it's good enough. And then there's also a situation of conditional reject where the to, you know we're dealing with the tolerance plus the uncertainty here and saying, all right, the uncertainty is so large, this is the best we can get we're okay here and then anything after that is is going to be in the fail column so instead of issuing a fail maybe maybe something to consider is you know conditional accepts and conditional accepts so measurement risk and uncertainty um, there's ways to lower both you can use the right calibration provider and have them replicate how the device is being used you can have competent technicians. You can use the right equipment. This includes adapters for those that were here early. Uh, and I'll, I'll go over this one more time. Our next webinar is on adapters. And you can lower your risk by using a calibration provider with lower uncertainties than what you're currently using. If you're using us and we can't do it, NIST, then you go to NIST. Um, you do things uh, on that nature, um, depending on how critical it is to maintain those tolerances and and maintain the two percent risk so we have a risk sheet an excel sheet anybody that logged in anybody that's you know going to watch this later can request uh our person in charge of marketing uh, is going to put this up on uh, one of the landing pages for people to, to download and then just some announcements uh please don't leave because we still have to i'm still going to pull up the measurement sheet but i wanted to for those that came late our next webinar is on proper adapters to reduce risk uh the technical paper is available if you want to read our technical paper on the various adapters uh, and what what they can do what what are some problems and then we have new training for 2019 as posted online um, again we have two training courses so that being said I'm going to exit out of here and go right to the risk sheet. So I have some questions that I'm going to, if you don't, if you do not mind, I'm going to hold off on the questions and go over the risk sheet and then I'll, I'll go back to, to those. So this is a uh, risk sheet developed by Morehouse and uh, E equals MC3 solutions. The first page is method five only and on the upper right it will tell you what you need to do. Anything in this, um, I guess I'm going to call it a manila colored, uh, can be used to help figure things out. Over here we have the repeatability as that goes in the denominator. We have uh, tolerances, it can be plus one count. I've not really seen many with plus two counts, so that's not coded in. So this example, say we have a, you know, a 10,000 pound load cell, instrument reads 10,000 pounds, that's going to force us centered. And we can say our tolerance, we can make a tight tolerance. We can do, let's say we need, have a really tight tolerance of, um, let's go with 025. So in this, in this scenario, 
this is now this is Morehouse using dead weights to calibrate this this O25 since the resolution of this device is 0.1 that is that is um, fairly coarse we use that whole denominator there and we look at this we get these types of numbers that say hey for the simple guard band, the method five, as per ANSI Z540, if we're, if it's 9999.501 to 10,000.499, we should be in. However, I said that that calculated risk based on 2.275. The real number, if you want 2% or less, or, or less risk, is 999.555. So we can go up here and we can, we can test it. We can say, okay, I read 999.99. Seven five, and obviously I I entered that wrong nine 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 point five 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 point. We can go up here and test that nine 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 point five five five, and there's probably more in the decimal place there, which we can take it out to another five or another four, so round it up, and that should give us our risk of less than you know two percent depending on what the decimal is and where it rounded um but or we can do uh ten thousand four four five and there upper risk two percent right there if we stick that number in all right in this scenario we have a little bit of lower risk so here's what i'll do i'll lower that I'll lower that uh, tolerance by a little bit, and then I'll use these numbers, and you can see it actually works. So 999.05 or um, 1,000.945, which should give us 2%. So and it does. So that's how the guard bands work. Uh, you can do different things here. This is the first sheet. It's method. It is method um, five. There's a button down here that lets you switch because you could say okay hey i have my current calibration provider uh looking at their cmc's it's o2 or looking at their cmc's it's o5 so you can see what that's uh what that does to the to the risk and you can switch between those graphs you can also enter the repeatability if we had repeatability numbers here at 10,000 pounds 10,000 we're saying read by 0.1 10,000 and then this repeatability will factor in to our risk. And you see, I, since I had some deviation in the repeatability, the risk went up to 2.03%. So that is the method five, the standard sheet. There are things there. I'm going to jump now because this is linked to method five. If you wanted to use method six, we have that programmed in on this sheet. It's the same graph that we just showed. Um, here we have total risk of 2.027, whereas method six, you can see those limits as long as we're within those limits, uh, we're, we are passing. And it will show you the difference between the lower guard band right here, lower guard band, upper guard band for method five, method six. You can enter your desired risk percentage in here and it'll show you what the upper and lower guard band is based on entering those risk percentages. And then here, Dillip wrote enter as a percentage without the percent sign. So again, these upper right tabs tell you a lot of what to do. This will figure the TUR for you. Now I must say the risk is, um, risk in all of these scenarios is any, whenever this graph, um, the tail goes beyond whatever part of it goes beyond the tolerance limit is how we are figuring and calculating risk. Another part, um, the third part of this sheet is if you have a, you want to do a full calibration and compare all the numbers, here's 10,000 pounds, 0.05% of reading, plus or minus account. You can say, hey, my CMC is 02. This method here will scroll through. There's method five, there's method six, there's, uh, sheet that says what's the difference percentage-wise of the acceptance limits 
And then David Deaver, I believe, wrote a paper in the, 19, the late 90s on uh, alternative method that's test limit equals the square root of the specification minus the uncertainty. This mimics uh, method six quite a bit, and it's included here. I do not know how many people will accept it. Uh, I'm, I'm still under the assumption that method five, the way this sheet works is you enter your information above here and then you populate, you can do one, two, three, um, three series of readings. You populate those um, and just go down for all the different methods. Now I did say something was buried in here. This is what's buried. If you want to do like a 98% for method six, uh, there's a little tab here. I don't know if you would want to do that or not do that, but that's the only thing that's really buried in there because I was doing some uh, additional uh, testing. So lots of different things, lots of different tools to use this sheet. Right now, I am going to cut off the, our actual recording for those that are going to watch the video of this, and I'm going to answer specific questions. So thank you.